You're listening to continuing coverage in the suitcase murder, The Trial of Sarah Boone, from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Now, back to the courtroom. And then after that phone call, uh, what did y- y'all, were y'all inside by this time? Yes, at this, at this point, I believe that it was a good time to get a change of scenery. So I thought George would be better off inside, and frankly, I didn't want to be outside any longer either. Okay. So just to get an idea, about this time is when he went to get the second bottle, or did y'all stay inside for a while before he left? No, um, from what I recall, it was, I thought the day was over, and it was going to be, um, get ready for the evening, for the day, what, maybe what do you want for dinner, you know, do you have an extra load of laundry that you need to throw in, kind of thing, and that was my understanding, and he this said... Was about, this was about five-ish or something? I don't remember the time. Okay. At some point during that time period, did George go to Publix again? Yes, I thought he was going to be walking to the convenience store, but apparently um, when he returned, he had gone across the street with my car and my debit card to buy another bottle of wine. What was your understanding of where he was going? To the convenience store, walking. For what? Cigarettes. Okay. And you've learned, you learned obviously, that he came back and you, you learned that he'd used your vehicle? Yes. And he'd used your debit card? Yes. And he brought back a bottle of wine from Publix. Correct. And you saw the uh, the Publix video of that. Yes. So he comes back with the other bottle of wine, and did he want you to drink with him? It was expected. Yes. Yes. And you, know, you agreed to consume the wine, the second bottle with him. Yes. Okay. So over the course of that evening, drinking the wine, did what did y'all do? for time-wise, uh, watch a movie, music, just kind of tell the jury what you remember. I know it's obviously been a while, but. Um, it was kind of a regular thing where um, I would always try to come up with um, entertaining activities for George and um, for, um, I bought a, a puzzle, um, we started off uh, at one point doing a smaller puzzle and then we did that very quickly so then I purchased a larger puzzle and I believe it was a thousand pieces so I thought to get his mind off of things and to focus on something um, it would be smart for us to do the puzzle so for however long that took um, we finished the puzzle so that was one did you you, every piece was finished or was it um, every piece was finished. It was strange that we couldn't find one piece, and we thought it was funny that um, it was like in like the perfect place on there. But yes, every every one but one piece. All right. After the puzzle, what did what did y'all do? Um, I decided to continue to maintain and focus him, and I have a bunch of paints that I used of my son's that. Um, his grandmother bought him. It's a very big art wooden box, and it's got pastels, pencils, paint, any kind of whatever. And um, he and I were very much into art. And with these, with this resource, it got him very interested in being more creative. How long have you been into art? Um, ever since I can remember. As a child. You like to draw. I like to do anything artistic. And I know, you know, we saw some of the pictures of your apartment, but it looks like there was pictures and artwork up. Is that all your work and George's work? The majority of it, yes, are uh, belongings from my home. Um, and then also some of George's, yes, on the wall. Was he pretty good at art as well? Yes. All right, so you both enjoyed doing that? Very much. So y'all got out uh, Lucas's art set. What did y'all do with that? Um, we were just, I guess, doodling, you know, whatever. I would always tell him that everything that you make is a masterpiece. So um, just let loose and just let it go. And we would just paint and, and you know, drink. paint and drink, yes, and uh, listen to music sometimes, and yes. Okay. Now with the dogs, did y'all get the dogs involved? Oh yes, my dogs follow me everywhere, yes. Was there some dancing going on with the dogs? Yes, after we had completed the puzzle and um, I guess we're painted out, 
um, I thought that it might be a good point for us to maybe listen to some music. Um, and the music that George listens to is a little, it's very fractious to me. And it was definitely not going to lighten the mood. So we ended up finding some channel on the radio and um, he was feeling it. And then we ended up, my one dog um, gets very active and was dancing with us and we were just um, having a good time listening to music. Okay. And uh, I guess it's getting pretty late in the evening. Yes. Anything else I've missed? I don't believe so. All right. So tell us, tell us where y'all ended up before, before you started the game of hide and seek. Uh, we were there. I couldn't think of anything else possibly that I had to continue entertainment. But I remember sitting at the end of the couch and. I'm sitting in my son's one of my son's chairs that was in the living room and just kind of doing this. Like, what are we gonna do now? Like, I very much would like to go to sleep. Um, had y'all had y'all finished off the uh, that bottle that he had bought? I don't remember, to be honest with you. Bless you. Would it be fair to say that as the day wore on, the more y'all consumed? Yes. Right. And would it be fair to say that as the day wore on, the more you consumed, the more, the more effects you felt from the alcohol? Of course, yes. Oh, both of you? Yes. Okay. So you would agree, would you not, that at the time y'all were trying to figure out something to do and you put your head down on the couch, that y'all, would it be fair to say that y'all were intoxicated? Yes. Tell the jury what happened. Um, at one point, I guess he knew that I couldn't come up with anything else, um, tapped me on my knee and said, you're it. So from there, I ran up the stairs and hid into um, our shower, um, just waiting for him to find me so we could hopefully go to sleep soon at some point. And, um, and your shower, is it, uh, is it a tub or just a walk-in? It's a tub, um, but it's in the master bedroom, and you have to go all the way upstairs, you have to go in the bedroom, and then you have to go into the bathroom part, and then there's the shower part. So did you lay down in the tub? I, at first, at one point, yes, I was. Okay, so you were hiding? I was trying. Okay, and did you believe that he was gonna come try to find you? Yes. Did you wait? Yes, for quite some time. All right, then what did you decide to do? that I decided that I need to go to sleep. I'm picking my son up the next day and we need to start wrapping up the evening. Um, and I went downstairs to find where he was. And what, <clears throat> I, think, I think the jury has seen pictures of your, would you call it an apartment or? It's considered a townhome. A townhome. So you walk down the stairs, right? Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the stairs is a bookshelf here? Yes, at the very end of it, yes. Okay. So you walk down the stairs and you turn and look in the living room. Did you, what did you see? Um, I don't even think I made it all the way down the stairwell because I was just looking for him as soon as I could um, to hopefully go upstairs as soon as we could. And um, I saw, I looked over and I saw him settling himself in the suitcase. All right, tell us about the suitcase. How, how long? Is it an older suitcase? Yes. Whose who's suitcase was it? This is George's suitcase. All right. And did he use it for traveling back and forth to Philly? Yes. I had uh, recently taken him on a trip to go see his children in Pennsylvania, who he hasn't seen in years. And we took that with us. And uh, because of how dilapidated it was, how broken it was, um, in the end, after that trip, we decided that we would donate it. All right, and uh, I understand y'all kept y'all kept the suitcase upstairs. Yes. How long did y'all keep it upstairs? Since we had moved in. Oh. Is there a is there a closet up there you kept it in? Yes, it was in the master closet, um, the master bedroom closet, all the way in the back because of um, the size of it, and there was nowhere to put it, so it's all the way in the back. So when did y'all decide to move it down from upstairs to downstairs? Was it that day or sometime earlier? No, it was um, maybe a week or so prior. Okay. 
And so what, y'all were gonna donate that to Goodwill or? Yes, we were going to do, I guess, a spring cleaning. Um, my, anyone who has children understands that they grow quickly and there was a lot of clothes that I needed to um, go through um, of my sons and then also from George and I moving in and just kind of putting everything in there, you know, at one point where we just needed to actually go through it and organize it and get things um, more in order. So is that the reason it was downstairs? <coughs> you're going to donate it and a bunch of things that you're going to put inside of it? Correct, yes. Okay. <coughs> so it had been down there a week, so it was already down there? Yes, George brought it down. Okay. So you said that you got down there, you're looking for him, you see him settling into the suitcase. Yes. What did you do? my head, I said, oh man, um, we're obviously not going to be going to sleep anytime soon. And um, I walked over and um, he was trying to get himself flat so I couldn't tell that he was in there and then... He now let, let me stop you there. The suitcase, is it the suitcase over here in the... Yes. In the box? You've seen it. You saw it. Yes. Uh, it's a pretty big suitcase. Yes. How, how big is George? George was my height. Um, and how tall are you? I'm 5'3". Okay. And how much did uh, George weigh? I, I thought it was 100 pounds. Okay. And how much did you weigh? Um, I was 98 pounds. All right. Do you agree you, you put on some weight? Since I've been incarcerated, yes. Well, at the time, though, y'all were, y'all were pretty skinny. Yes. So, um, from the pictures, it looks like y'all are both pretty thin. Yes. Um, all right. So, because of his thinness, uh, is that how? And, and he's he's a small man. Yes. Okay. So he, he was able to get in the suitcase on his own. Yes. Did he willingly get in the suitcase? He was already in there. Okay. When you got to him, did he see you? Yes. All right. Tell us what happened. Um, I, I mean. I just kind of, I zipped him up. We thought it was funny and um, we're joking about how he was, I guess, small enough to fit inside of the suitcase. All right, so what happened then? Um, from there, it was just, um, we were laughing about it and um, it was just strange that he was small enough to fit in there and then um, I, kind of moved it around a little bit with him in the suitcase still. It was still funny that he was still in the suitcase. Just, I think he and I were just kind of, couldn't believe that he was, he could fit in the suitcase. Did you eventually close the top? Yes, in order for, well, the top was already closed. As he was settling himself in there, it was that's how I knew he was in there was because the top was kind of flopping a little bit. Okay. So he had gotten in there to hide and he pulled the top. Yes. On top of it. But you could tell he was in there. Yes. You saw him right away. Yes. All right. So at some point did you zip him up? Yes. Did you? And what was he saying or doing when you were zipping him up? I just thought it was funny. Um, were you both laughing? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so you zipped him up. Were y'all still laughing once you zipped him up? Yes. Okay. Tell us, tell the jury what happened then. Um, from there, I just I moved the suitcase around uh, a couple of times, just kind of with on the wheels and moved it around. And um, at that point, it was still it was funny. We were joking and laughing about it. All right. Now, eventually, did you go sit down? on the couch and get your phone? Um, yes. Um, the, Did I miss something? Um, well, I, the suitcase had, um, for me moving it around, had flopped, was flopped over. So while it was like that, I thought at that point I had a moment to, I guess, take the time to talk to him. Well, I guess he was not able to get out for a moment. So you flipped it. You got you got it on the top, right? Yeah. It gets in, but at some point you flip it over. So he, the zipper is on the bottom. Well, 
Well, it was just kind of how I was moving it around and it ended up kind of flopping, so. It was upside down? Yes. So after you did that, what did you do? Um, that's when I, I went over and decided to um, videotape to just see the, um, I guess the, the jest in it for him to understand that right now I feel safe and right now I have the ability to actually speak to you um, in a manner that normally I would not have the ability to do. And you were intoxicated. Yes. And you would agree that you said some things you should not have. Yes. But you, you realized he could not get out and get at you. Is that fair? At that moment, yes. So the, it goes on for about 10 minutes. Um, yes. Did you, you heard it here today, did you not? Yes. You heard, you heard his voice as he was speaking from the suitcase. Yes. That was his voice on the video and audio. Yes. And you heard your voice on the video and audio. Yes. That was your voice. Yes. All those things said by the man were said by George in that two-minute video. Correct. All the words said by the female were said by you in that two-minute video. Correct. Were you intending on showing him the video the next day? Yes. At the time or the next day, is it fair to say you don't even remember a video day? I do not. So, from what you can tell from watching it, did that refresh your memory about that event? It did. Why did you say all that? Mr. Owens, you may proceed. All right, I'm talking about just the two minute video part that was recorded. Could you just tell the jury what you were feeling, what your feelings were at the time, and then explain, just explain that to the jury. You, you mentioned, you talked about it before. You said he was in that confined space and it was my chance, but is that, do you want to elaborate on that? Or? Sure, I, I want you all to know that I, the majority of the time, am always afraid and always scared. All right, well, I understand that. Okay, I understand that. But um, would it be fair to say that you had some anger at that point? I did. I, would it be fair to say that you wanted to tell him off to some degree? I just wanted, yes, for him to have a better understanding, um, which was the whole point of the videos and documentation prior. And you could tell that he was uncomfortable. I'm guessing. And did, did you want him to feel some uncomfort? I did. Okay. Now at some point, you turned off the video. Yes. And then we saw a second video, which was approximately 11 minutes later. And you've seen that video that was played to the jury. It was 22 seconds long. Yes. And I don't think you speak in that video. You hear George say Sarah one time. Yes. Is that fair to say? Yes. So between the two minute video and the 22 second video is an 11 minute period. Would you tell the jury what happened? Um, we continue to, I guess, speak to one another and um, his tone changed and I knew the tone and um, we ended up, I guess, arguing back and forth with one another and it was the things that he was saying um, very much frightened me and um, cursing at me and threatening me and did he want you to let him out of the suitcase? Um, I'm, I'm sure so. Okay, go ahead, tell, tell me. Um, and it just got, it got very heated very quickly and he continued to push on the suitcase 
and um, my fear was that he was going to break out of the suitcase knowing that it was a broken suitcase. And um, his hand started to come through, his, his hand started to come through this way. And so I shook the suitcase, I shook the suitcase trying to get his hand to go back in, shaking it and telling him that, please stop doing this. Please, please stop doing this to me. Please stop doing this to me. So his hand, his hand actually got out of the suitcase? Yes. And you went to the suitcase? Yes. And shook it? Yes. Did that force his hand to go back in? No. Um, so you're shaking it. Were you shaking it to try to get the suitcase, his yes. hand back in? Yes. How long did you shake it? I don't know. But his hand was still out? Yes. Was he trying to get out? Forcefully, yes. Was he angry at you? Yes. Were you in fear? Always. If he would have gotten out of the suitcase, what would he have done to you? Like he used to tell me, he probably would have made me unrecognizable or I would have uh, lost my life. Did you lose the grip on the suitcase? Yes. Where was the bat in relation to the suitcase? Um, it was um, leaning up against the dining room table right there. How far was the bat from the suitcase? Three feet, two okay. feet. Was the sand still out of the suitcase? Yes. And was he getting out of the suitcase? He very much was trying, yes. And so what did you do? For the split second reaction that I had, I happened to see that and I grabbed the baseball bat and was trying to poke his hand to go back in to please don't go, don't break through, please. So I hit his hand. Did you hit the outside part of his hand? Yes. We've seen the photographs of his left hand. Did you cause the bruising there? I'm guessing yes. Now, you've seen the bat. It's a, uh, a youth bat? Yes, I bought it for my son. Is this the bat you used? Yes. And you said you poked him with it? Yes, I, I kind of pushed, um, like I held it with the skinny part here and then... So the, so the grip here? Brought it at it, yes. You grabbed, you grabbed it with both hands here. Yes. And then the barrel of the bat, the big part of the bat is here. Correct. And you thrusted it in, into the s different areas of the suitcase? I started with his hand and his hand, he was still trying to get out. He was still trying to do that. So I started to push on the suitcase around it, hoping to have his hand retract and go back inside. You made those injuries. I did. We've seen the photographs. Yes. We see the, the bruising. Is that from that bat? Yes. Eventually, did his hand go back inside from you doing? Yes, finally he had, had subsided and retracted his hand. So in your mind, did you prevent him from attacking you? Absolutely. Split second decision. Now once he retracted his hand, did you, do you remember zipping it up some? or What did you do in relation? Because he, he was upside down, was he not? At that point? Yes. You, at some point you flipped him back up. I did. Tell, tell how that happened. He wasn't <laughs> cursing, he wasn't threatening, he, his hand was inside. Foremost. There was no more of him trying to break through the suitcase. So I felt safe enough to turn it back over. It wasn't, it wasn't happening anymore. You went back to the video and the couch? I did, yes. 
we saw the second video. Yes. The 22 second, and he's right side up again. Yes. And you hear him say, Sarah? Yes. <clears throat> Had you left enough room for him to get out? Zipper to zipper. Yes, that's how his hand was trying. That, that suitcase has two zippers, doesn't it? And they meet at various places along the line? Correct. How much room, when you flipped it over, how much room was between zipper to zipper? I don't know specifically. I mean, it was enough to where his hand was coming out. After you had hit him with the bat, was he not trying to get out anymore? No. Did you believe that he could breathe in there? Yes. Did you ever believe he could die in there? No. At all. Were you trying to kill him? Never. Did you want to kill him? I did not. Did you walk upstairs? I did, yes. Why didn't you let him out before you walked upstairs? Were you afraid? Terrified is more of the word. As long as he was in the suitcase, he couldn't harm you. Correct. When he's... Did you want him to calm down? Yes, I wanted him to stop being angry because I know what it is for him to be angry. You went upstairs. Where were the dogs? The dogs ran upstairs with me. And where did they go? Um, on the bed. Did you have the phone with you? Yes. I know at some point you called your husband, Brian, did you not? I did. Do you recall how long that conversation was? Not very long. Can you recall what was said? I don't remember exactly. No, I don't. Ms. Boone, Sarah Boone, you said that uh, when he was in the suitcase, he was threatening her, threatening you. Can you tell the jury what he was saying? I don't know. Am I allowed to curse? Yes. Um, but he was going to fucking end me. And it, that's what made me ask him please to stop doing what he's doing to me, that he was going to, I'm guessing, try his best that night to probably take my life. But what, the, the threat you heard was he's... You, he's going to... Say, say the word. Fucking end me. Excuse me? Fucking end me. End you? Yes. One more. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Judge, can we approach the bench? Yes. All right, members of the jury, it is 2.14. I have a matter that I have to discuss with counsel at this point in time outside of your presence. So I'm going to ask you to retire to the deliberation room. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Again, similar instruction that I've given you. Please do not conduct any independent investigation or research as the person, places, things, or charge involved. And do not have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else about those things. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. Jury,
may be seated. Thank you. State, you can proceed with any argument at this point in time. Judge, I believe that's pretty close to what we already knew from the deposition testimony uh, from the doctors relaying what she said for the proffer. What we have here is testimony from the defendant. Um, her timeline is she comes downstairs after having gone up to the shower and hiding, laying down um, after being declared to be it. She comes back downstairs and before she gets back to the bottom of the stairwell, she can see that um, the victim is in the suitcase trying to get flat uh, because the lid is flopping and he's not, he's not hidden just yet. Um, and so she comes over and I believe she testified she was moving it around before uh, actually zipping the lid shut, but moving it around, everybody's laughing, it's all fun and games still. And then she zips it and it's still fun and games and everybody's laughing. And then at this point she testifies that this is now her opportunity to get on her pulpit to express her true feelings about everything. And that's when she sits down on the couch and opens up her phone device and begins recording what later turns out to be IMG uh, underscore 1062 dot movie at 11, 12, 45 for two minutes and three seconds. During this period of time, the decedent is expressing um, meekly that he can't breathe. Uh, the only time he ever curses at her is, Sarah, I can't fucking breathe. Babe, I can't fucking breathe. Um, he is demonstrating under the law that he is in fear uh, of losing his life. Um, she has committed an aggravated assault. She has committed false imprisonment. She was the initial aggressor. There was no overt act to justify these actions that she took against her boyfriend. She then goes on to say that during this period of time between the end of the movie at 11, 14, 48 seconds, and before the next one starts at 11.23, that it's now at this time, while he's still constrained and clearly unable to get out under his own power despite having his hand out, um, she begins beating him with a bat, um, poking his hands, poking the suitcase with a deadly weapon. A bat is used for baseball, but it can also be used to harm another person. And according to the medical examiner's testimony, there was great harm caused to him, deep ecchymosis bruises. Um, she can't start to do this out of fear, like the analogy I gave earlier. If I pull a gun to rob you, judge, and you pull a gun, I can't shoot you in self-defense. She, she started this. She started this. There was no overt act, um, and therefore, um, we're asking for you to prevent, under the case law, uh, any prior instances of, of violence, um, any reputation evidence, and any battered spouse syndrome evidence, um, because that's simply just what the case ended up being. Thank you. Response. Judge, this was a game by two intoxicated people. When people are drunk and intoxicated, they do silly and stupid things. The evidence is uncontroverted that George Torres willingly, by his own choice, elected to hide in the suitcase. By their interaction between the two of them, giggling and laughing at each other, he consented to her zipping up the suitcase. And the playful nature of what was going on during those few minutes prior to the video. When the video is turned on, there's a two minute period where they're talking. He's saying, I need to get out, I can't breathe. She's not taking him seriously. As you've seen from the videos, I thought it was the boy crying wolf. She did not appreciate the fact that he could be actually having trouble breathing. And this was a chance for him to be heard by her about how she felt about some things involving their relationship. A short time later, the video was turned off 
And then that period has been testified to by my client. And that period is uncontributed. That's a second period of time. We've got that time for the video. We got the 11 minutes, we got the 22 seconds. And there's no video, there's no audio, there's no eyewitness, there's nothing but Sarah Boone's testimony. And she's testified here today that they had words, there were threats, he got his hand out of the suitcase. She knew by the threats and him getting his hand out of the suitcase that he was about to get out of the suitcase and he was going to hurt her. A reasonable person under that scenario would believe he, she was about to be harmed. She was an imminent threat of harm. She blocked that attack by grabbing the bat, hitting his hand. When that didn't work, she started poking him with the bat in the suitcase. Eventually, she poked him several times. He put his hand inside the suitcase. She put the bat up. When she realized he was not gonna do that any further, she flipped him over right side up. She still had a fear, knowing that if he got out, she would be harmed. He would beat her up. She went upstairs. That is an overt act based on the discussions, coupled with the fact that he threatened her, using the word, I'm gonna fucking end it for you, or some words to that effect. I don't remember her exact words just before she went upstairs while he was still in the suitcase. If she would have let him out, and this is a crime, now, now this is an event involving an omission failure to act, failure to unzip him at that point before she went upstairs. The failure to act, the failure to unzip, which would have let him out, um, which would have created a situation that she believed was imminent bodily harm to herself. And I guess I'll get a, a couple of examples um, let's say that a police officer is called to a scene and the only thing he hears is uh, there is a suspect and the suspect may be armed. So of course the officer pulls out his revolver and he's walking around. Well then eventually he finds the suspect and the suspect reaches for his waist. The officer doesn't see the gun but the officer sees the movement to the waist. The officer fires and shoots the suspect. The officer is justified because there's an immediate threat of harm. The officer has to react instinctively. There's no time to think. Similar to the actions that Sarah Boone had to take. Another example, you're in a bar with your buddies and you've had something to drink and another group has had something to drink and one of your buddies gets into an argument with one of the buddies on the other party. And one of your friends seeing that it's being escalated and the, the guy that's arguing with your buddy is aggressive, more aggressive than your buddy is. Your buddy's trying to settle the thing, but this other individual, maybe he's had too much to drink and he's more aggressive. So you go around behind this individual, and before he's able to strike your buddy, you grab him, you lock him up. That's physical restraint to block an attack. Or you grab him by the neck, and you choke him. Physical restraint to block an attack. That's what she was doing with the suitcase. If she let him out of the suitcase, she was going to be harmed. Based on him trying to get out with his hand, based on the threats he made while he had his hand out, and based on the threats he made while he had his hand inside just before she went upstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Court's going to re-review all the case law that it's obtained in its research in this matter and come back with an oral ruling momentarily. Thank you. We're back on the record, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone, case number 2020, CF 2603. Uh, appearances for the state. Steve Ketchikor on behalf of the state. We have the state. 
Defense. James Olmitz from Miss Boone. County Henderson from Sarah Boone. Coming back on behalf of Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is currently seated at council's table. Wearing the same clothing from this morning, the court has had the opportunity to review the case law, review the arguments provided by both the state and the defense. The court finds that a overt act has been established. The case law is clear that a scintilla of the providing of an overt act is sufficient to provide the self-defense jury instruction. Um, an overt act is not something that's specifically defined in Florida case law. It's something that's from the totality of the circumstances, seemingly under the authorities that the court has reviewed. As such, the court is going to find that under Holland, a overt act has been established and will allow the, dissent, the uh, defense to proceed with evidence of reputation and specific instances of conduct and battered spouse evidence so long as the necessary predicates are established for those items. Any questions or clarifications with regard to the court's order state? Yes. Defense. I think it would help if we went through my exhibits involving the blow-up photographs and these other photographs because I think some of it was contingent on the court's ruling. Uh, so I don't know if you want to try to deal with all of them one at a time in front of the jury or whether we want to just talk about them ahead of time so that we know. Are there any objections to those items? It depends on the items. I was shown a lot of different things, including like a, a rap sheet uh, between the, the victim and the defendant. So I've, I've taken that. I just, we need to, I'm happy to take care of some of this stuff in advance. So. I'd rather do it now. Yes. So that's not up, down, in and out with uh, with the jury. So, All right, go ahead, Mr. Owens. Okay, so what do we got? Well, I I had the clerk go ahead and mark everything. Some of it is a composite. Is this it here? This first is um, identification. Defense identification K. It's four pictures. Involved in the injuries to the leg. Mr. Owens left what? The leg. Assuming a predicate for fair and accurate depiction, etc. is laid, we don't have any specific objections to case. Okay. okay. Identification, defense identification, composite. L, two photographs of a burn to her leg. You said that was L, correct? Yes. Again, assuming proper testimony uh, that the decedent was responsible for that in a criminal manner and fair and accurate depiction, we have no specific objection to this time. Okay. Defense exhibit M, for identification. Photographs. The first one is a photograph of the back porch. Sarah's on the back porch with her two dogs. The next photograph is a picture of one of her dogs on one of the outdoor couches. Judge Relevant says that he would threaten the dogs with harm if she didn't comply with his directives and she. He actually harmed the dogs, kicked the dogs uh, as a threat to her. So in order to do what he wanted, he used the dogs. She was in fear for their safety, so she would testify about this threat. Relevancy objection is overruled. Identification. Defense identification number N, or letter N, one photograph. It's a photograph of the living area, but also the stairs, and it shows that uh, one of the allegations by the state is that the defendant. Okay, no objection. No objection to, uh, assuming all the normal practices. Uh, Judge, this is where he took a bath. Uh, it's five photographs where he took a bath to the TV, to Sarah's TV. My understanding, is this O? This is still O, correct? 
Yes. Right. My understanding from the state is there's no objection so long as the foundation is established. Yes, sir. Thank you. We, we also intend to introduce the video. There's a short video on the Sunday State's Exhibit 2. We're not going to that okay. as long as the foundation is No objection so long as the foundation is established. P, identification, defense identification P is two photographs of an incident in which. No objection as long as the foundation is laid, et cetera. No objection, so long as appropriate predicate is established. Now these, elect these next ones are individual photographs, not composites, but Q for identification is one photograph. Is that part of the right stuff that we're already done? This, I was told this was separate from the burn. This was, a, I think, a slap or something that came to the lab, not from the burn. Okay. No objection, foundation. With regard to Q, no objection, so long as the appropriate foundation is laid. Identification R. No objection, as long as foundation is laid. No objection to R, so long as foundation is laid. S. Same for S. Identification. With regard to S, no objection, so long as foundation is laid. Same for T. T. No objection by the state, so long as appropriate foundation is laid. Same for U. No objection from the state, so long as appropriate foundation is laid for you. Same for V. Same for W. W. Same for X. X. Same for Y. Y. These the ones that we addressed pre-trial? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. No problem with that being a demonstrative Okay. In terms of introducing this as an exhibit into evidence. Duplicative, competitive. Is it contained in K through Y? Yes. Then, uh, uh, is that accurate? I believe so. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know the clerk probably doesn't want the blow up, but uh, if it's it's going to be easier to handle the clerk to handle the uh, eight and a half by eleven. Uh, 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 if it's, I'll you, allow you to use it for demonstrative purposes, but I'm not going to accept it into evidence as it is duplicative. Of what's already in evidence is X defense premarked X. And then um, identification C. Same thing. That was either it was one of the earlier ones we addressed. M or N was the staircase. Okay, for the same reasons, um, you can utilize it for demonstrative purposes, but um, it's duplicative as the exhibit itself will be entered into evidence, presumably. D, for identification. Same thing, it's one of the photographs and it's on the state's digital exhibit. Any disagreement that it's included in your pre-marked? I agree. Okay, then same ruling. Uh, it is duplicative, you can utilize it for demonstrative purposes. Identification E. Same thing. Is it included, sir, in K through Y? Yes. Uh, then for the same reasons, it's duplicative. You can utilize it for demonstrative purposes only. F for identification. Same thing. It's included in your submittals? Yes. All right, same ruling. Uh, it's duplicative. You can utilize it for demonstrative purposes, but it will not be accepted into evidence. Identification G. Same thing. Is it included in your submittal, sir? Yes. Sir. All right. For the same reasons, I find it's duplicative. You can utilize it for demonstrative purposes, uh, but not seeking it into evidence. H. Same thing. Yes. Or, um, same ruling. You can use it for demonstrative purposes, but it will not be received into evidence uh, by virtue of it being duplicative. Identification I. Same as T. 
Any disagreement with that, sir? No, sir. Same ruling. If my court finds it's duplicative, uh, you can utilize it for demonstrative purposes. Identification. Clerk. Hang on. Is that the house? It's either Delta or B. Uh, I think that's Bravo. Is it the defendant on the porch with the two dogs? Yes. That was pre-marked before trial as Bravo. Same. It was um, as defense M. Relevancy objection is overruled, all, but I'm not going to allow the enlargement as it's duplicative, as the native photo is in evidence. But you can use it for demonstrative yeah, purposes. I probably want to use these in closing and just use this, uh, use that for the. For How, the however, you see for, fit, sir. Okay, this is not working today? I can't speak to that. I don't know that anybody today has utilized it. But that's not connected to the overhead. That's separate and apart from the overhead. Okay. Oh, okay. Judge, what other evidence do we have? Do we have body cameras? Excuse me. Yes. Nothing else? Nothing else through Sarah. There, there may be some body cam footage to refresh memories. We've got, we've got two deputies out there. Okay. All right. Um, any other exhibits with regard to Ms. Moon at this point in time, Ms. Owens? No, sir. State any reason why we cannot ask Ms. Owens or Mr. Owens to continue his inquiry of Ms. Boone and have her return to the witness stand. Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Owens, anything else we need to discuss, sir? One moment. Sure. If we can bring Ms. Boone back up to the witness stand, once she is seated, we can bring back in our panel. Right, let's go ahead and stand and bring back in our panel. State, you recognize our jury? Yes, sir. Defense, you recognize our jury? Yes. All right, thank you all can be seated. Members of the jury again, you could, once seated, raise your hands to confirm that you complied with the court's instructions during our last break. Record reflect all hands have been raised. Mr. Owens, you may continue with your inquiry, sir. Thank you, Judge.
Ms. Moon. So I think we left off. You had called um, your ex-husband? Yes. All right. After, after you called your ex-husband, what happened after that? I ended up falling asleep. Okay. Do you remember waking up the next morning? Yes. Did you sleep in? Not intentionally. Okay. But you didn't get up at 8 o'clock, did you? Did you wake up closer to noon? I believe so, yes. Did you check the time? No. Now, um, did you hear some phone, your phone ringing? Yes, my phone was ringing. And uh, did you answer it right away? No. Uh, do you know how, approximately how, how many times it rang before you answered it? I believe the call was about three times. Did you know who was calling? I figured it was my ex-husband. And why would he be calling? Um, to make sure that um, I was still on schedule to pick up our son. At three that afternoon? Correct. And he goes to school there close by? Yes. All right. When you woke up, did you stay in bed for a while? For a little while, yes. All right, tell the jury what happened when you got up. I knew it was my ex-husband calling um, repeatedly. Um, I didn't answer right away because one of our problems is that he doesn't understand that I'm doing things around the apartment and looking for jobs and so on and so forth. So I inevitably just let it ring and I sat or I laid in the bed and I figured that George was downstairs either drinking or um, looking for jobs um, or may have just left and so eventually I decided to get out of the bed and start moving to go downstairs I was motivated enough to go downstairs and um, when I went downstairs, it was very quiet. So I had the understanding, I believed that he had left. Um, and Did you check to see if he was, where would he be looking for a job at? Um, usually on the couch, he would have my son's laptop and he and I, which we would share. You all, you all only have the, the son's laptop? Correct. And the TV was not working at this time? The TV was not there. Okay. So you thought he would be in the living room on, on the laptop? Yes. He was not there? No. Where else did you look for him? Um, I looked on the back porch. Um, I went through the front door um, to see if my car was there, thinking maybe he had taken my car. Um, I checked the bathroom, and when I was checking the bathroom, I saw the suitcase, and I remember about the night prior, and I unzipped the suitcase and... Let me stop you there. You said you were in the bathroom when you saw the suitcase or coming out of the bathroom? No, where our bathroom is, I would have to go to the bathroom here and then when I turned around I noticed the suitcase and I remember. How did you feel when you saw the suitcase? I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that before. Describe it for the jury. I guess it was... I was aghast and... I just can't describe the feeling. Bless you. It was terror to a, you. a certain degree. I'm sorry, say that again now. It was terror to a certain degree. Um, I just can't describe it in words, the feeling of remembering. And then he was still in there. So what did you do? I immediately unzipped the, 
I immediately unzipped the suitcase and I was screaming, George, 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 and I was shaking him, I was shaking him. And I pulled him out and I stretched him out flat and then I began instantly trying to do CPR and then was trying to look for a pulse or a breath or just anything and um, was just screaming his name over and over and over again and come on George, come on George. And I continued CPR, continued CPR and I continued CPR and um, he was gurgling and... What color was he? What color was he? Yes. He was purple. At some point, did you call your, your ex-husband? Yes, when he started to gurgle and I knew that my, my ex-husband is notorious for bringing my son over in very inopportune times when George is possibly drunk or doing things not appropriate for my son to see. And um, I just didn't know what to do. It was just a quick knee-jerk reaction. Ryan was kind of my go-to person because of my family being deceased and I don't have anyone else that I can call. Um, and I just wanted to ensure that he would not bring my son over in the process of all of this at some point. So you called him? I called him. Did you ask him what to do? Or did you just tell him to come over? I just told him to come over. Did you tell him that you felt like George was dead? Yes, I did. And how far? You said it's five minutes from house to house? Yes. Did you call him back? Yes, because he was taking so long. It felt like the seconds were hours. Yes. I'm still doing CPR at the same time in the process of it. I'm now, doing CPR I don't know how many times. Did he get there? Yes. Did he walk in? Yes. Did he walk out? Yes. What did he tell you to do? Call 911. What did you do? I called 911. Is that the recording we've heard here in this trial? Yes. Did you love George? I to to this day. Why did you love him? George was very passionate. George was a very real person. George was nice to me on the good days. George complimented me. George and I were two bodies with one soul, he and I would always say. I don't believe that I've ever had a connection with anyone like I have with George. Did you have that connection with your ex-husband? I did not. Was it even close? No. George has some good traits, doesn't he? Very much. Did George have some bad traits? He did. Did you drink too much? I did. Did George drink too much? Yes. Tell the jury about George's drinking. If George was able to, he would drink from sun up to sundown. And me having my son and trying to work and maintain the home and just have a life, a normal life as best as I could, somehow that upset George. And because I had a certain dollar amount from my divorce settlement, at one point, it was from wine we could afford vodka, so a lot of the times he would take my car and my debit card and go buy the large, we call them handles, of vodka, which is the big, big bottle. And sometimes he would finish that all off on his own throughout an entire period um, of, a, of, a day, of a day into an evening. That's honestly where I thought that he was going to be that morning when I came downstairs because he's notorious for just automatically already being outside from drinking all the time. All right. And um, <coughs> mm -hmm. 
who said you have an alcohol problem. George has an alcohol problem. Yes. How did George's drinking adversely affect you? It would debilitate my ability to help him the way that I was always trying to help him because it would be one good day, a day of survival, um, and then it would be another day where I'm having to peel him off of me and call 911. Why, why would he get that way? Tell us, tell us his pattern as it relates to drinking and then objection. Approach. Objection's overruled for now. Okay. You already go the three and a half years? Yes. Is there times when, when he would get to a, a state of intoxication where he would get violent against you? Quite often. Judge, can I approach the witness? Yes. As long as you show it to the state first, please. photographs and see if you recognize those? I do. Uh, those two pictures of your body? Yes. Do they show injuries to your body? Yes. Were those injuries caused by George Torres? Yes. Are those photographs a fair and accurate depiction of the injuries you sustained at the hands of George Torres? On this occurrence, yes. Do you remember this occurrence? I don't. It was so often. You don't remember a specific specific date? I don't. But you're sure that that's you? Yes. Is that the injuries that he... What's the injury to the ribcage? Um, I don't remember specifically. This may... These may be the pictures. So... Uh, when we used to go over to his brother's house, his one of his brothers and his sustained. Do you know what happened to? Did, did George cause these injuries? Yes. All right. Did were y'all both drinking at that time? I don't remember on this incident. Okay. Judge, I'd like to move this uh, exhibit to Okay. Right. What was pre-marked as P will be received into evidence without objection is Defense Exhibit 2. So. <laughs> Looks like there's, I think there's a wheel on the top where you can use to. Uh,
will show you identification, defense identification Q. See if you recognize that photograph. Yes. Is that your thigh? Yes. Okay. Do you remember this incident? Yes. Can you tell the jury what happened? I wanted to take my dogs for a walk and get off of the back porch. Were you all drinking? Yes. And um, he was upset that I would rather go walk my dogs than um, sit there and continue to drink. Um, so he slapped my thigh as possibly hard as he possibly could and said that you're not going anywhere. And it was, it was a good smack on my thigh. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the, uh, the wound that you suffered as a result of George Torres slapping you on the thigh? Yes. Judge, I'd like to offer Q and evidence. No objection. What was pre-marked as Q will be received into evidence without objection as defense three. You may, sir. And for the jury's sake, is this the photograph you just mentioned? Yes. More continuing coverage in the suitcase murder. The trial of Sarah Boone is on the way. From the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Press subscribe now.